about a year ago, I went into a dog meat farm in a region of Southeast Asia. And my intention for going into the farm was to document what was happening to the animals and to raise awareness about the suffering that was being committed towards them. And so as I wandered around the farm, I came across these buildings. And inside of each of the buildings were rows and rows of pens, concrete pens, where the walls were made of concrete and the floors were entirely made of concrete. And in each of the pens were dogs with their tails cut off, their teeth cut out, and their ears mutilated. As I continued to wander through the farm, I saw a recurring pattern, a theme of dogs with deep lacerations, open wounds, and bloody sores that had been caused by the other dogs who had, from their extreme boredom, frustration, and even insanity, chosen to attack and cannibalize the other dogs. And so I took a moment to myself in the farm and I stood there and I said, how can we do this? How can humans justify doing so many horrible things to other living beings who feel and who are conscious and who are sentient? The problem with that story is that it's not actually entirely true. There's two differences between the story I just told and the story that's true. And the two differences are it wasn't a dog meat farm in Southeast Asia. It was a pig farm in England. But everything else about that story is the same. Rows and rows and rows of concrete pens. Pigs with their tails chopped off, their teeth cut out, mutilated ears. Pigs with deep open wounds, bloody sores and lacerations caused by the other pigs who were suffering from insanity and intense boredom because they were destined to spend the rest of their life in these prison cells without ever being able to go outside and breathe fresh air or experience sunlight. And so I stood there. And I asked myself those same questions. But I said to myself, how can good, kind, and compassionate people be involved in a system that perpetuates so much violence and needless suffering onto others? Now, we've all seen or at least heard about footage taken from farms and slaughterhouses that reveals the hidden horrors that happens within these facilities. Most of us become shocked, appalled, maybe upset maybe even angry. But then we normally say something like, well, that's in a different country. That's in America, perhaps. Or that's one bad farmer or one bad practice. But it doesn't represent the industry as a whole. Or we say, yes, but I know that the animal products I buy come from farmers who love their animals like their children. And they're killed in slaughterhouses where it's performed so-called humanely. Now, the ostrich effect is a cognitive bias where when confronted with information that is upsetting, potentially offensive, or makes us challenge ourselves in a way that perhaps we don't want to be challenged, we turn away. We hide from it. We pretend that it doesn't exist. We bury our heads in the sand, hence the name the ostrich effect. Now, time after time after time, farms and slaughterhouses are exposed for the horrible things that happen to animals within them. And I'm not just talking about factory farms. Local, organic, high welfare, humane, it makes no difference. They've all been exposed. Now, in 2017, I co-created a documentary called Land of Hope and Glory, which was an expose of UK land animal farming. And so we used a footage taken from over 100 different UK farm and slaughterhouse facilities from Scotland down to Cornwall, from Wales across to Norfolk. And we documented what happens to animals from birth to death. Now, one of the most common criticisms that people give us for the documentary is they say, that footage isn't from the UK. That doesn't happen here. That's not fair. That's not truly representative. And we knew we were going to get these comments and criticisms from people, which is why when we made the documentary, it was so important to us that we didn't just single out and isolate little pockets of illegal animal cruelty but instead just really showed standard industry, legally condoned, welfare condoned practices. So for example, we show the gassing of pigs in CO2 gas chambers. We're in the UK every single year, a third of all the pigs that we slaughter are killed by being herded into a cage that's dropped into a chamber that's filled with carbon dioxide that's so aversive, it causes the pigs to hyperventilate, become breathless, start panicking, start screaming and squealing and thrashing around and banging their heads around until they die. This is considered the most humane method of pig slaughter 
by our government and by welfare organizations, and indeed by governments and welfare organizations across most Western countries. We also show the gassing and maceration of day-old male chicks. We're in the UK every single year, up to 40 million day-old male chicks are killed either again with the use of CO2 or by being thrown into a giant macerator while they're conscious and they're ground up alive. This happens because they don't produce eggs. And it happens in all systems of egg farming, including caged, free range, organic. It doesn't make a difference. We also show what happens in the dairy industry. Cows are mammals like us, which means that they only produce milk to feed their children. And so for a farmer to have a cow who will produce milk for him to sell, the cow needs to have had a child which means that the farmer will forcibly impregnate the cows by restraining them and using a process called artificial insemination. Now, I think to describe the next process of dairy farming, I want to talk about a personal experience I had back in 2017. It was during my first visit to a dairy farm. I and a few others went into the farm with the intention of showing what was happening to the animals, filming their stories, uploading it to raise awareness. Now the farmer knew we were there, he saw us walk in and he didn't really seem too bothered by our presence. And so we wandered around the farm for a little while and we came across a pen. And in this pen was a cow with her baby. And her baby was still so newborn that the mother cow was still in the process of cleaning her baby. The farmer came over to us. And he said, I'm going to take the baby away from the mother now. Now, every single calf in the dairy industry is separated from their mother normally within 48 hours of being born because the more milk the calf drinks, the less milk the farmer can sell and us humans can drink. And so I filmed and watched as the farmer proceeded to enter the pen with a trolley, like a wheelbarrow. And he picked up the calf and he threw the calf into the wheelbarrow I began to walk away with the calf. I ended up stood next to the mum. Um, the two of us, we walked as far as we could, following after her child. And then the farmer closed a gate on both of us. And I looked at that mother as she watched her baby being taken further and further and further and further away from her. And that was the last time she'd ever see her child. In that moment, she looked up to me and our eyes made contact. I saw fear, I saw anguish, I saw sadness, but I also saw confusion. And I realized in that moment that the animals who we exploit have no comprehension of why we do the things that we do to them. I mean, of course, we can't explain it to them. They don't speak our language and nor do we speak theirs. So they live in a state of confusion. And I thought about all the times in my life that I'd been most scared and how often that fear had been coupled with confusion and ambiguity, a misunderstanding or lack of comprehension about why these things were happening to me and how much worse combining those two feelings exacerbated the problem of fear, loneliness, and isolation. So let's say that we could talk to the animals. Let's say that we could explain to them why we're doing these things to them. What would we say? What would you say? What would you say to that dairy cow, that mother in that moment who's watching her baby being taken away from her? Would you say, I know you're a maternal and matriarchal being and that you will greatly mourn and grieve the loss of your child. But the thing is, I really like the taste of your lactations in my cup of tea, my cup of coffee, or congealed into a block of cold cheese. What would we say to the dairy cow who's been forcibly impregnated? Would you say, I know that you don't want to go through this procedure, this invasive procedure that's completely needless and is done just so that I can consume something that you produce for your child, but it's a bit inconvenient for me to buy oat milk in the supermarket instead. What would we say to the pigs being lowered into the gas chamber? Would we say, I can see you thrashing, I can hear you screaming, and I can tell that you're obviously suffering and in pain. But what you've got to understand is that I really like the taste of your flesh in between two pieces of bread that I call a sandwich. Or would we say, I know you want to live a life without fear, without needless exploitation, just as I do. But the thing is, going vegan is a bit extreme, don't you think? Because really, what else could we say to them? We couldn't say, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. 
I really wish these things didn't have to happen to you, but what you have to understand is it's a necessity for my survival because that would be a lie, and it simply isn't true. We don't do these things because we have to. We do them because we want to, or more importantly, we do them because we enjoy the product that comes as a consequence of the things that we do to these animals. But the reality is our body needs cow flesh or chicken flesh or lamb flesh as much as it needs Labrador flesh or cat flesh. Our body needs cow's milk, sheep's milk and goat's milk as much as it needs dolphin milk or rhino milk or giraffe milk. It just simply doesn't. And so the question becomes, what has higher value? taste or life? Which do we place higher on the chain of value? Our taste preferences or the life of an animal, the one life that they have granted to them? Do we really value the 15 minutes of sensory pleasure that we get from consuming their body parts and secretions as more than the life that they are given? And can we use personal choice as a justifier for our exploitation of animals? And should someone's action simply be respected because they've personally chosen to make that action? I mean, every action that we make and every choice that we make is a personal choice, regardless of whether that action is good or bad, moral or immoral. And when we cite personal choice as a justifier for exploiting others, whose personal choice are we considering other than our own? Do we consider the personal choice of the trillions of animals that are killed every single year who, if granted their own personal choice, would rather just live their life? Or do we simply continue buying a product because we've always done it? It's what our peers do. It's what society tells us is okay to do, and it becomes an unconscious decision for us to make. And so how do we morally justify this? What moral justification do we have and can we use to excuse exploiting animals when quite simply, we don't have to. I want to go back to the dairy industry for a moment now. There was a survey conducted by the British Cattle Veterinary Association, and it revealed that every single year, 150,000 cows are sent to the slaughterhouse while pregnant. It went on to show that 40,000 of these pregnant dairy cows are in the late stages of pregnancy, meaning that the baby inside of them could well be capable of independent life. Now, there are no real legal guidelines to protect unborn calves, um, but the RSPCA, which is Britain's leading welfare organization, has a set of guidelines that advises slaughterhouses should follow in the event of a pregnant cow being sent to their slaughterhouse. And the guidelines are as follows. It says that the cow should be killed in the same way as she would normally, which is a bolt in the head to stun her before she's hung up on the line and has a knife pulled across her throat so that she bleeds to death. However, they then state that the cow should be left on the bleeding line for at least five minutes to ensure that the baby inside of her has time to die as well. A vet who used to work in UK abattoirs had this to say about her experiences of watching this happen. Sometimes, when the cow is hanging on the line bleeding to death, you can see her unborn calf kicking inside their mother's womb. I, as a vet, am expected to do nothing about this. Unborn calves don't exist according to the regulations. So I'm expected to stand there, watch, do nothing, and keep quiet. It broke my heart. I felt like a criminal. However, the same survey from the British Cattle Veterinary Association also went on to reveal that over three quarters of the pregnant cows sent to slaughter were sent by farmers who said they didn't think the cows were pregnant, or at the very least simply just didn't know or weren't sure which means that over three quarters of the pregnant cows are sent to slaughter, are sent to the slaughterhouse without the slaughterhouse being made prior aware that they're pregnant. So the cow's killed in the same way, bolt in the head, knife across the throat, but they're not left to leave, not left to bleed on the hanging line. And so often what can happen is the mother cow will be cut open and the baby inside of her is still alive, breathing, conscious. And so the RSPCA, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals states that the humane way to kill a baby who has just been cut out of their dead mother is to shoot them with a bolt or hit them over the head with a blunt instrument. Their first and last experiences of life are on the floor of a slaughterhouse. Now, we've all been raised with a set of values, 
dictated to us by the cultures and societies that we were raised in, values passed down to us by our families, and values that we assign to ourselves, even with all those confusing cognitive biases that exist within us all. But society has always changed and progressed precisely because we dared to challenge the dominant paradigms. The stagnation of progress comes from the refusal to challenge what we have always done. But as Aristotle once said, the roots of education are bitter, but the fruit is sweet. We can no longer bury our heads in the sand and shy away from something simply because it offends us, upsets us, or makes us think or question and challenge the lifestyles that we live and the routines that we've adopted in our day-to-day -day life. Can we honestly still claim that what happens to animals is isolated and a rarity? Or is it time for us to acknowledge the violence that we commit towards animals is systematic and ubiquitous, and the blood is on our hands because of the actions and choices that we make collectively as a species, but also as individuals as well? I left that dairy farm that day, and I left that mother cow in the pen, and I left her baby in the solitary confinement pen that the farm had thrown them into. I left, but they did not. Their fate had been sealed for them before they were even conceived. And so I could go back to my life, have fun, spend time with my friends and family, do things I wanted to do, fundamentally live a life that wasn't dictated for me by someone else. But they couldn't. And so when I left, I made a vow to myself. And I vowed that I would never let their suffering fall far from my mind. And I would definitely never ever claim that suffering does not exist. Because even if we refuse it with our eyes, with our ears, and with our thoughts, what animals are forced to endure is an objective reality that exists even if we claim that it does not. In our authoritarian ways, we've arbitrarily chosen to point the finger and give certain species of animals different fates. For the cows in that farm, and indeed for cows in any farm across the world, it's exploitation and death in a slaughterhouse. But for other animals, who are identical in every single way that matters, it's a life of love and companionship in our homes, in our families. One of the defining characteristics of our species is our ability to evolve, adapt, to self-reflect and criticize our actions and then change accordingly. Morality has always changed. And so as our knowledge and understanding about the complexity and wonder of life continues to evolve and change, so too should our attitudes and tolerance to those other beings who coexist on this planet with us and not for us. As humans, we are very different to the non-human animals that exist on this planet. But what we share in common is what is paramount. We are all alive. We are conscious. We have friends, we have families, we have the capacity to feel, we have the capacity to suffer, and we wish to avoid that feeling of suffering. Our life is shown to us through the subjective experiences that we all have as individuals. Fundamentally, we just want to live a life of peace, of happiness, of tranquility, without the fear of being needlessly exploited by someone else. So is it time for us to consider all animals within our circle of moral consideration. To understand that it's not the way that we exploit them that matters, but the fact that we exploit them and use them in the first place. Is it time for us to make a change? Is it time for us to go vegan for ourselves, for our planet and the environment, but also for them? The other beings who may not walk like us, talk like us, or look like us but who definitely deserve a life of freedom just like us. Thank you so much for listening.